Hi there, my name is Memo, this is my channel House Planty Goodness, and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. You might be able to see some of it behind me, it's tropical houseplants. So I always get the question from loads of different people actually, and there's been a few viewers that have requested this video specifically, is I've got a big plant collection. I know this. <laughs> uh, but where did I start and how did I end up here, basically? So I thought I'd give you a bit of a historical overview of my plant collection slash obsession and talk you through things that I have learned along the way, plants that I have tried that have worked well for me, plants that I've tried that didn't work well for me, and what that generally entailed in terms of my learning experience and <laughs> what got me to where I am now. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think let's let's just dive into things straight away and say I'll dive in further back. I know some of the people that have been here for a while will know this, but my kind of obsession of plant interest started from a very young age since the age I was that weirdo kid that used to run around, my parents would lose me at some point, usually in fields somewhere because I'd sit there staring at plants or flowers and all these things and bring them things and go, look, this is so cool. And yeah, I was that child. <laughs> Which then led me into studying biology, a lot of uh, really getting into biology quite heavily in school, going into a human anatomy degree, moved away from that field quite quickly after that. But I've always kind of had an interest in kind of the natural world and kind of how things grow, what makes them tick, and just enjoying the sheer beauty that kind of plants and nature can bring, not just indoors, but obviously outdoors, which is where all of these plants are intended to be. We just, with a lot of the tropical indoor houseplants, no plant is an indoor plant, they are all outdoor plants. It's just that a lot of the tropical plants can do okay in a household environment. And again, controversial opinion here, very rarely will they thrive as much as they would thrive in nature in a household environment. We can get that as close as we possibly can, but the reality, at least for me, is that they will never be quite as spectacular as they would be in nature because that's where they're intended to be, basically. We are just emulating what we can internally. But at that stage where I was really interested, my mother had a lot of tropical house plants. I am an 80s baby, <laughs> um, which meant that my parents were around for that boom of house plants in the 70s. And we most definitely had an awful lot of house plants. I don't think I ever counted, but it's only now looking back on it as an adult, thinking we probably had over about 100 to 200 house plants. Some in the house, but because I was still growing up in Cyprus at that point, which is very, for people that don't know where that might be, it's very close to Greece, but it's also quite, quite close to Egypt as well. So the temperature is even higher than it would be in Greece. It's, it's slightly drier, but you still get some of that humidity. It's, it's a weird mix. It's not tropical, but a lot of the plants that you might be seeing in my collection now, I know full well that if I was still living in Cyprus, they would be on the balcony year round because it doesn't get that, that cold in the winter. And even if it does for a few days, yeah, you might get some of the plants struggling. Some of the more sensitive ones, like potentially the Esmeraldense that has a bit of an issue with the cold weather, probably wouldn't do that well there. But a lot of the other plants are just living their happiest life out and about in a balcony. If I time this video right, I will be visiting my family back in Greece, and my mother does have nowhere near as much of an extensive collection of houseplants on their balcony there, that again, they're there year round. And if I'm there while I'm editing this, I'll see if I can get a few extra clips and insert them throughout this video so you can see what the collection looks like now. And again, this will be filmed in January, and you'll see what the states of some of these plants are in January on that balcony. It's not gonna look great, but they are still surviving and they come back year and year again in the summer. They have their heyday for a large chunk of the year and then they'll go a bit more dormant and look a bit janky in the winter time. And that's fine. And then they'll do the same thing the next year. They've been growing happily like this for years, if not decades, basically. So 
that's the thing. In Cyprus, the difference is that a lot of these plants are not only just in balconies, but some of these are just grown outdoors. So I recently visited my family there and I haven't been to Cyprus, unfortunately, for very many years, but I did go recently and I was looking at my dad just thought, oh, because you can grow bananas outdoors and get them to fruit in Cyprus. I'm just like, oh, is that a banana plant that you've got in the garden? And he's just like, no, no, that's not a banana plant. I don't entirely know what it is and it looks very similar. And it's only when I looked at it closer at this thing that was probably about three stories high, it was a bird of paradise. So it was a Strelitzia Nikolai, I think, as well. It was absolutely huge, just growing out in the garden. It was fine. The same thing, and I've mentioned this a few times on my Instagram usually, every time I go back to Greece or Cyprus, it's only now that I've been into my tropical houseplants for as long as I have that I kind of look at it and say, where I live in Athens, so my parents, sorry, a bit of background for the people that might not know this. My parents fluctuate. The, the family business is based between Athens and Greece and Cyprus. So they will spend a month in one of the locales and a month in the other. And they've been doing this for many, many years now. So I consider home to be both places, basically. So when I'm back in Greece, however, I go and where we live is quite close to the beach. So from my balcony, it's probably about 100 meters to the beach, 200 meters to the beach. So quite coastal, if that makes sense. A lot of the trees on the pavement, so you'd get all the trees that the councils will put up on the pavement. Like here, there might be cypress trees and all these things, but there, there are massive ficus elasticus. Massive rubber plants everywhere, huge trees, massive trees. Uh, you get yuccas that are absolutely huge. You still might get some other kind of interesting plants that again, tend to be considered more tropical plants. There are just landscaping plants. So something to bear in mind. Uh, but that's kind of when I was starting when I was young and all these things. And then when I was, when I first moved to the UK, and I don't think I'm going to have any pictures of this time in my life because <laughs> I was a student at university, which meant that I probably didn't do anywhere near as much studying as I probably should have done. But I did have a small house plant collection. And kind of friends were always kind of saying, oh, you're really into your house plants and all these things. And I did. And I was, I was loving caring for them. But at some point, kind of life got in the way. I started a business. I started my bakery business at that point, or patisserie business, essentially. And it just got a bit too much. I was doing 14, 16 hour shifts. I couldn't do all of it, basically. So I kind of stepped away from my passion at that point. And years later, I moved out of London, several jobs and businesses later, uh, moved to the location where I am now. And I I kind of, houseplants were starting to boom again. And this was, I would say, about four to five years ago now. this I was one of the people that got into it with all the hipsters <laughs> around uh, just before the pandemic, basically a year or two before the pandemic. And I was, and the reason why I got into it again then is because I was seeing more interesting plants come out on the market rather than just the traditional Monstera Deliciosa or the... Um, Pothos plant. So it's just a bit like, ooh, and I think actually some of the first plants that I got, and I will see if I can find pictures of some of these plants from Instagram. And I will caveat this and say they are Instagram pictures. They didn't always look as pristine as what they were on my Instagram. Obviously, they were Instagram worthy pictures, if that makes sense. <laughs> Friendly reminder don't get disappointed if your plants don't look like the plants that are on Instagram. Because I will tell you for a fact, not just from my own personal experience, but from everybody else that I'm seeing as well, there is a lot that is happening to make those pictures look good. You, what you might not be seeing is a brown leaf behind what the camera is seeing or the editing that's happening behind all these images. Yes, people do edit their images. It's sad, I did it too. But it's the truth as well. So, <laughs> But I think the first few plants that I got was, one was a fern that was growing on a lava rock, which up until recently I was growing and it was doing fine. I took it out to my greenhouse, unheated greenhouse to retire, so to speak. And having checked after the last frost, it has retired. Uh, <laughs> uh, that one, the Begonia maculata whitei, 
So the polka dot begonia, and I'm trying to think what else did I buy at that point? Maybe the neon pothos? I can't remember. The picture would have all three plants that I bought, I can't remember. But then I got into other plants. So for instance, um, the ponytail palm, that was one that got added to the collection, a whole bunch of peperomias, because there was a lot of people touting about peperomia this and peperomia this. So I had the string of turtles, I had the peperomia rosso, what else did I had? I had the metallica at some point. I had a lot of the peperomias, a lot of the peperomias. How many of those peperomias still exist in my collection? one, which is surprising because it is a variegated form of a specific peperomia, which I th it's the one that's like a mini rubber plant, basically. I can't remember what the name is, the scientific name, I'll find it and put it at the top there. But I've, I, I never had the green version, I only had the variegated version, and six, nearly seven years? Still have that. Doesn't look great. Do I like it? Not particularly. Did I like it when I bought it? Not particularly. Will I be sad when it goes? Probably not, maybe a tiny bit, because it's been there for a while, but that's the only reason I'm... I will say this with my chest, I am not a fan of the peperomias. I tried, I did try, I gave it a good college try, I can't get on board with its care, I could never keep them happy for long enough, and for how dramatic for me and my care that I give my plants, those plants were, they weren't worth the effort. For me, I know that there's a large community of people there out there that love peperomias. You do you. But it really wasn't for me. And that was a good thing. I learned that very early on that I'm just like, you know what? No, just no. For the sheer level of like care that I need to give you and baby you and how small you will stay. And again, this might be one for people with small apartments that don't have an awful lot of space and they don't want to live in a jungle, but they do want to have a lot of plants. Peperomias are a viable option if you can keep them happy because they stay relatively compact and they can be quite nice ornamental plants, basically. And there are so many different foliage options when it comes to peperomias, colors, all of these things that I am sure you will find something that works in your space. But at that point as well, when my, start, my collection started growing, I was growing, and I'm trying to think what it's called, it's like an entrance way, where you come into a house in the UK and it's usually got glass around it, and usually you take your boots and your coats off. Is it a cloakroom? Possibly a cloakroom? I don't know. Well, I'm, I'm just really blocking on the name now. I'll put it at the top there. And it was getting decent light because it was in a south-facing part of the house, it was getting great, great light. I learned very quickly the use of net curtains, although I never liked net curtains because I'm just like, they look a bit like old granny like houses with the net curtains. Boy oh boy did I change my tune at that point and put some net curtains in really quickly when I started to get leaf burn for a lot of my plants. Interestingly, even from this conservatory, that space has been my best growing space. Like, I could do no wrong in that space. It just worked beautifully. It was tiny as well. And by the, by the end of it, before I moved to the next house, which had a much bigger space, uh, it was quite a crammed little space. And it was maybe two meters by a meter and a half. It was a box room, basically. But it was getting great, great light. It was like living, it's like a very large terrarium almost. And it was a rental property and it did have fitted carpets and I'm pretty sure that that carpet wasn't in the best state by the time I left it. We did clean it and everything like that before handing it back and the, the state agents were fine and all these things, so that was all right. But uh, that was a lovely place to get moved out of because I got my eviction notice two days after New Year's. That was great. Not because the landlord was bad. We'd been there for like five or six years, but uh, we found out afterwards that it was a business entity that owned that property and a lot of other properties, and they went bust, so they had to sell, basically. So less than ideal. But you know, I was actually visiting family in Greece at that point, and doing viewings via FaceTime. That was joyous fun. And this was just before the pandemic. Moved to the next property, which was a much bigger, kind of it was a utility room, which used to be an old kitchen for these people. So the lighting wasn't great, but it was a massive space, probably three times the size of this conservatory, if not more, actually. Um, that's when I learned a lot about artificial grow lights. 
So, and that's also when I learned that regular LED, bright LED strips, the ones that you would have under the counter, work just as well as really expensive grow lights. There you go, free tip. Doesn't cost anywhere near as much, and you can kind of maneuver it to places where you want it to be, basically. That's when the metal shelving came in. At that point, I was starting to get a lot more into some of my rarer aroids. By this point, I'd also kind of realized what plants I could abide and which ones I couldn't. And I was doing more conscious buying in terms of not only what I kind of wanted to get, but also pricing wise as well there. Because a lot of the plants that I was getting when I was in my first property, which was some of the more common allocations. Basically, I'd, at some point or another, I have had most of the house plants that you could get in, uh, most of the common plants that you could get readily in the UK in most kind of plant stores and or kind of garden centers. And that's not a flex, that is kind of accurate. I, did, I spent a lot of money and like every weekend was at the plant store basically. <laughs> but I learned a lot. I also learned after that to maybe exercise some control. And because I got to the point where my collection was getting so big and I wanted to add in slightly more interesting and more ornate plants that I really wanted to get and I'd been saving money for and all of these things for a lot longer, but I didn't have space because I had some of these plants that I could easily replace years later, basically, because they would always be there in the kind of garden centers. And there's nothing, there's no hate on those plants. It's just that's not where my passion and my collection was going for me. So at that point, and I will always say the same thing that Sarah says, the plant rescuer, try not to throw some of these plants away. There is a lot that goes to get these plants to you. And a lot of these plants, instead of me, the ones that didn't die of natural causes, uh, were gifted to friends who wanted them. And they didn't have a plant collection. They then pretty much inherited half of my plant collection and they've now got their own plant collection that has grown since then. <laughs> so if you're just starting out, Watch out for that maybe on some of the Facebook groups and all these things for however much I don't like Facebook groups for reasons. Um, there is some merit to kind of, I think it's plant purges potentially where people are just kind of getting rid of some of their older plants. You can get some of these plants either for free or for really, really much cheaper than you would probably get them in a store and probably from a much more mature and established plant as well. So keep an eye out for that because had I've done that when I was going through that initial stage of buying everything, uh, and I think a lot of us have gone through that stage of buying everything, <laughs> that, that's a good place to start as well. Another thing that I would say I've learned along the way, and this might be a bit of a controversial opinion, and I might do a separate video on controversial plant opinions, is, and people were saying this at that point, and I didn't quite grasp it, be very cognizant when you're starting off and you maybe don't know an awful lot about plants yet on buying rare and expensive plants. And I will separate that into two categories. One being rare as in like, they don't come up very often, but they might not be rare in nature and expensive plants that might be trending plants, which again might not come up very often and they might have very specific care needs. What I'm trying to say is think very hard before you spend triple digits on a plant that might be on the fussy side, that there is a high chance that you might kill off two months after you get into plants and you don't quite know yet. And not only will potentially that money be wasted, and yes, there is that notion that that plant, that money is not wasted because it was a very extensive learning experience. But there's also potentially people out there that have been doing this for a long time that have been trying to get that plant and they could have maybe made it survive that could have got that had you not have bought that. But as I said, it's a controversial opinion and I see both sides and I get both sides. So I'll leave it at that because that, that's a minefield of a topic there. But yeah, so I've learned kind of at that stage is maybe don't spend an awful lot of money when I was still learning on some really expensive, really kind of challenging plants. Maybe wait for a bit longer before you start getting them. And then I did start getting some of these expensive plants, which 
leads to why some a lot, a lot of my plants or my plant review series I've had for two, three or four years. It's around that time when I started getting these plants, probably a bit earlier than some of the reviews, but I did have my fair share of deaths of plants before I got to the point of being able to care for them longer term and get what they're like. The other thing that I learned further down kind of my journey, and this is a comment that I've got from a lot of people, is that you always talk about philodendrons or anthuriums or monsteras. Why is everybody always so fascinated with this? And I'll give you my two cents on that one. Is yes, there is a wide variety of genera of plants that you could have. And I'm not thinking about even genera now, I'm thinking about specific plants. So, and I'll put them into categories. So yes, you'll get some of the things that are like um, your African violets, and you'll get things that are succulents or class of succulents, even though there are, um, it's succulents is one of those terms. Let's talk to anybody that does collect what everybody classes as succulents and mention the word succulent. It's, it's a topic of conversation because, yeah. Um, because it describes the plant, it doesn't actually tell you very much about the plant other than, yeah. Um, or cacti, or bonsais, or I'm trying to think what else, or the gingers, or all these things. Some of these might be aroids, some of these might not be aroids as well. So, or your carnivorous plants and all of these things. It's a wide world of kind of plants that you can have out there. And a lot of the times, the reason why you're seeing as many videos, at least in my opinion, this is what I think is happening, of so many philodendrons and anthuriums and monsteras and all these things, barring that there's a status thing for a lot of people that get them because they're rare or get them because they're expensive and um, uh, the popularity thing as well. I'll remove that for just a second and say that at least in my experience, and I think this might hold true still for a lot of people, regardless of that popularity aspect of it, they tend to be easier or they have been for me to grow. And if you've been growing for as long as I have the plants and you have to deal with the difficult and the less easy plants a lot of the times, you generally want to make your life easy. And I'm not going to do sweeping generalizations across any of these generous to say that they're all difficult or they're all easy. And don't get me wrong, yes, some philodendrons have got the clout by some people that they're very easy. I've had easy philodendrons. I've had philodendrons that I cannot keep happy and they die off like that for me. So monsteras for me tend to be the ones that tend to be more ironclad, like most monsteras. Not all of them, but most monsteras, in my experience, have been a bit more, eh, it will just do its thing even if you mess up a few times, basically, it's fine. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, there's things that you learn along the way. and. The reason why I have as many philodendrons, anthuriums, monsteras, all of these things in my collection is because they work with the care that I give them. So I want to make my life a bit easier. If I had this many plants and every single one of them was unique with its idiosyncrasies because of the genus that they're in, and I very rarely choose to bring in genuses that I don't know anything about. Like I bought in the Piper Sylvaticum a while back, and I was a bit worried about it because I'm just, I don't know anything about this. It turns out that for me, at least, it's been relatively easy care, so I'm happy with that as well. But that's another thing that I learned along the way is keeping to genera that I am comfortable with. So I'm comfortable with Hoyas. One that might surprise you as well is uh, I have almost entirely given up on ficuses. I love the concept of ficus, but I think the only ficuses that I've got left are two ficus elasticas. I've got one, might be the petiolata upstairs, uh, which just, nah, it's one of those plants is, it needs to be composted or maybe gifted to somebody who knows how to care for them well and really gets excited for them because I'm just like, I don't care enough to keep you happy. And then I went to the recent plant swap in London and I swapped with an amazing person uh, and I got the ficus Audrey again, and the people that have been here for a while will know my original ficus Audrey had a few leaves, it was doing great, it was growing loads of roots. Three years later, it was still on the same three leaves and didn't do very much. And I had a chat with the individual and they had a much bigger plant and they were keeping it happy. And I'm just like, you know what, let's try one more time. And what I've got to report now, and I know it's winter time, and I know that this is winter time, great roots, 
plant seems super happy. I'm still on the same amount of leaves that I had when I first got that plant. It's fully established, like almost the entirety of the pot now is full of roots. <laughs> um, but yeah, ficuses for me, they're not my jam. Same as the way the peperomias are not my jam. Same way that I've kind of got to the point where calatheas or kind of most of the prayer plants, I'm just like, you're not worth the effort anymore. I've, I've given up on things like ZZ plants. I like the concept of a ZZ plant, but I've mentioned this several times before. Cannot keep a ZZ plant alive to save my life. I do have loads of sensivaria still. I do have some succulents. I've kind of reduced the number of succulents that I had because it's one more thing that I need to care for. Ironically enough, that doesn't take anywhere near as much time as all of this, but it's still time that I'm just like, you're not bringing me enough joy. So either I'm gifting you or you're gonna die off basically. So it is what it is. But, and then we get to the collection that I've got now and you can see things that are happening. Another thing that I've learned along the way is to, and I would love, to, I'd love to say that this is something that I think can come naturally and faster to some people. I, I think this is going to be a situation of time when you're first getting into plants and house plants and everything's really exciting. Everything is also really dramatic when things go wrong. I was the same. I cannot believe that I'm saying this years later that I used to get kept awake worrying about pests on my plants or when I got thrips on my plants for the first time because I heard about all these things with thrips or all these things. If you do it for a few years and you get the larger, more established plants and you're generally confident in your skills in caring for a lot of your plants, you're a bit more like, eh, what are you going to do? I tried my best, but that there is that that comes with years of doing this, basically, or time, basically. It doesn't have to be years. I'm, I'm out, but just be a slow learner here. But yeah, like there's crispy leaves. There's leaves that are drooping. There's, there's, there's plants that might be on their way out because they've got root rot and I'm trying to nurse them back. If they die of root rot, is it as soul destroying now as it used to be before? Probably not. But do like there's, there's one of my favorite anthuriums which is the one that still nobody knows what it is. Is it a Metallicum? Is it a Magnificum? Is it a hybrid? We don't know, but still love it. It's huge, huge leaves. I'm looking at the very top there. I think I may have done a review as well. If I have, I'll put it up at the top there. Massive leaves, absolutely massive. Like I can't even fit in the frame how big they are. It's like almost half of my torso, basically. And three big leaves, four big leaves, lost three of the biggest leaves, all yellowed out, but it's this time of the year. And it doesn't matter what I do with that plant, I always find, because I always kind of try to repot it and stuff like that, I will always end up getting root rot in the winter, because my worry with that anthurium is I'm underwatering it, but in the winter it almost turns into a bit of a cactus. It kind of doesn't need that much water for me. It's on its last leaf now, and that'll be fine. That will see it through the winter, and then it will come back stronger again. For next summer. But that only comes through with experience and also years for having can cared for a plant as well. The one other bit of advice that I might give here is with a lot of people when their collections are constantly growing, the question that I always have for people like that who are maybe two, three years into their growing collection, what's your oldest plant? Have you kept at least one of the first plants that you bought when you got into your plants? How's it doing? What did you learn from that plant? Because I think there is value in some of these plants that you've had for years because they teach you that it might look like it's gonna die for a whole year. And if you haven't given up on it, you wait for it, maybe the next year or the year after that, it's gonna be the biggest plant you've ever seen and happy as all Larry. Well, maybe you change something. There is a lot of value on not changing over your plants entirely since you first started and having some plants. So for instance, I was talking about the Ficus elastica that I have, which is the Taniki, I think, or the, the kind of pinky variegated one. Still there, one of the first plants I bought, that plant is probably six, seven years now old. 
Did it have a very long period of time where it looked really happy, really unhappy and like it was on the brink of death? Yes, for nearly two years and I should have got rid of it potentially at that point. I didn't. Is it looking really happy now, mainly because I've kind of let this do its own thing? Yes. But you learn things along the way. And again, I will say, like I always say in my videos, these have been my experiences and this is some of the advice that I think I would have liked to have received when I was first starting off. Whether or not there's any value, I don't know. But as I said, this is, a, this is an interesting topic that people have asked for. So let me know your thoughts down below. Have you had a collection for many years? Do you agree with some of the things that I was saying? Have you had different things that you've learned along the way to me? Put them down below. If you're just starting off, did some of these things surprise you? Um, I don't know, but I mean, the one thing I will say for people, if, if you are just starting off and you're watching this, enjoy it. It's a great hobby. There's also a lot of stress that people put on themselves to keep going with the hobby. And I've spoken to a lot of people like that on Instagram. It's also okay to walk away from this hobby or any other hobby if it's stressing you out. You can reduce it and see if that brings your stress level down if you're still seeing some value in it. But ultimately, a lot of us do this for mental health reasons, for whatever that might be. If this is then going to cause you more issues than it's solving, walk away. That is also acceptable, basically. But uh, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people that if you decide to do that and move away from your collection and you do the plant purge thing, will be more than happy to <laughs> take on. So if you're feeling guilty that your plants might die, they probably won't. You, they can just go and live their best life with somebody else, basically. Um, if you're still enjoying it, great. You're like you like a bit like me. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say for this. Let me know your thoughts down below either way. And yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed. Hopefully you have a great rest of your day and hopefully I shall see you here soon. Thanks. Bye.